Okay, dads, let's go ahead and get started, guys. Now, some of you have already let me know how uncomfortable you were in last week's meeting. So tonight, we're going to try to respect each other's boundaries. What? Tonight, we've also got a guest with us, David. And would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, hey, guys. I'm David. David. Hey. Up, David? Hey. How many kids do you have, David? None. At least not at the moment. Uh, my wife is pregnant, and uh, she should be delivering any day now. Mm, that's great. So Super. Oh, great. Awesome. Who'd like to go first? Anyone. Anyone. I'll go. Perfect. Todd? Yes. My daughter and I went to the mall, and she said she wanted to take the stairs to the second level. And I said, I don't trust stairs because they're always up to something. <laughs> Todd, I'm sorry that happened. Okay. Yeah. I encourage you to try to resist the urge to make jokes like that. Yeah. My turn? Okay. Can I go? Okay. Yesterday, actually, my daughter got home and she asked me how my day was. And I said, well, a guy tried to sell me a coffin, but that's the last thing I need. Oh, Jerry, oh, Jerry that Jerry. joke is dead on arrival. Because it's the last thing I need. David, <laughs> how about you? Oh, I, I didn't, I didn't say this. This is a safe zone. Just jump on in. Yeah, I, I'm, I guess I'm just scared of being a dad. I'm afraid I'm gonna start telling bad jokes just like my dad. Well, it might be in our nature. We can fight against it. Hey, speaking of nature, I tried to catch some fog yesterday. I missed. <laughs> M-I-S-T. Oh, You're a monster. I, I, this is where the boundary is. I'm done. This is where you are. Hello? Really? Okay, yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I'll be right there. That was Julie. Her water just broke. I guess the baby finally ran out of womb. <laughs> I'm gonna be a dad. Don't you think you should be going? Oh, yeah. So I told my wife she drew her eyebrows too high. She seemed surprised. So we had donuts with dads this morning, and uh, I don't know if you were able to be in here or not, if you're, uh, but if you were there, you saw on the table there were cards with dad jokes, and um, just to sort of keep the dad jokes going, I, I thought it would be good just to ask you a question, and that is how do you uh, go about putting together a space party? Well, you plan it. That's the only one I'm gonna do, you know? I just really appreciate that video. I really appreciate the joke. I'm Pastor Ryan, I'm the lead pastor here at the Bridge Goldsboro. I'm so glad you're here today on this Father's Day. Uh, we're in a series called I Am. We're talking about the statements that Jesus made that we can know exactly who he is. I can't wait to get into that with you in just a minute. But before we do, I wanna take a second uh, and say thank you for being here. If you're here for the very first time today, thank you so much for being here. There's a connect card in the seat back in front of you. If you're watching online, there's a digital link you can click and just let us know you're here. There's a spot where you can say, I'm here for the very first time. We would just love to connect with you. Uh, very briefly, if, you, if you're on site today and you take your Connect card to the VIP desk outside, we have a gift we want to put in your hand. Just a quick way of saying thank you for being with us today. And I'm here to cordially invite you back to next week. Uh, we say if you come and you're here today, you're our VIP, you're our guest. But if you come back next week, you're our family. And uh, we're just excited that you're here today. And in fact, that Connect card is actually for everybody in the room, everybody watching online, because it's a way to get information to you. If you want to take a next step at the bridge, there's a place where you can check and say, hey, what are my next steps? Uh, if you're interested in baptism, which by the way is coming up on the 30th, there's a place on that connect card for you to do that. Um, if, if you have a prayer request, there's a place to you to put your prayer request down. And so we wanna make sure that we're not just having Sunday morning services and seeing each other for an hour a week. We wanna make sure that we're connecting together and making sure that you stay resourced. And that connect card is the absolute best way to be able to do that. Uh, baptisms, I, just, I mentioned it a second ago, is happening on the 30th 
5th of this month. So if you're interested in baptism or hey, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ and put your faith in him, uh, according to scripture, your next step is baptism. So if you've never been baptized, if you want more information about baptism, take that connect card, let us know. You can also register online at bridgechurch.cc forward slash events and you can get to our events page from the, the website. Uh, we just want to make sure that we are working together as a family, not to just attend church services. You're going to hear me say that probably a lot. Uh, if you've been here for any length of time, you've heard me say it. We don't just want to go to church. We want to be the church. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. On June 23rd, we're going to be feeding the homeless. And so uh, we actually have all of our spots filled for that. Thank you so much for volunteering. And we're gonna, we do this every other month. So if you wanna be a part of that, um, you, can, you can register online. You can obviously write it on the Connect card. We'll get more information to you. Uh, this go around, we have all the, the people help that we need. But guess what you can do? You can pray. Because every single meal we serve, we're not just giving it to a person, it's also a soul that's gonna spend somewhere in eternity. And so one of the best things we can do is pray. Can, would you agree to do that? Just to say a prayer for our team that's going out there, but also for the organization we work with, Tommy's Foundation, who works every single day with the homeless uh, and hotel families, those that are living in hotels, such a great work they're doing. And we're so excited to be partnering with them and to be a part of that great work here in our county and our city. Um, also, uh, on, in, on July, the first week of July, July starts our Summer at the Bridge series. That was a mouthful. I tried to get it out. Summer at the Bridge. And so we know that everyone goes different places for the summer. Uh, it's hard for us all to be in one place at the same time because everybody's going on vacation. Uh, and so we're doing two things for this. One, uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks, you're going to get a little small Frisbee and it's going to have Summer at the Bridge on it. And this is what we want you to do. We want you to take it wherever you go. And we want you to take selfies with it. If you're at the beach, we want you to have that Frisbee and put the beach in the background. Mountains, same way. Wherever you're at, we want you to take selfies with that thing. And we want you to post it online and tag the Bridge Goldsboro. And we're going to take a random post and we're going to give them a gas gift card. Uh, and so in the next couple of weeks, when you get that Frisbee, take it wherever you go. If you're doing a staycation, then take it in your living room. How many of you love staycations? Let me give you a little tip. Go on vacation and make sure you leave the last two days you took off work at home. It's the best thing you'll ever do. You're welcome. Uh, but we want you to do that. The second thing we're doing is we're having people come in and, and speak during Summer at the Bridge, different voices maybe that you haven't heard of before. Um, and I'll, I'll give you two of them right now that, that are kind of cool. One, my friend, Pastor Nick Worrell, right down the street at One Church. He'll be here delivering the Word of God uh, during July. And also, uh, my lovely wife, Whitney Barbado, is going to be preaching also at the end of July. And so, uh, yeah, some of y'all started to clap. Was that you? No, that's, that's her stepson right there, by the way. Uh, so he's, thank, thank you for clapping. But we're excited. She actually has uh, a couple more weeks at the Bridge Princeton where she serves as the Bridge Kids Director uh, and she'll be transitioning out and then she'll be right here with us at the Bridge Goldsboro. I am personally very excited and I know you are. Uh, and I also want to take a second to say we're having a, a wedding reception uh, for all of our church family to come and meet her. Uh, we actually have the wedding video and that's going to be happening on the 23rd uh, and that's next week. So we hope you guys can make it. It's at 4 p.m. right here at the Bridge Goldsboro. Uh, we went to the mountains and got married and we just had our immediate family there for several reasons. Uh, but the biggest one I can tell you is because in our immediate family, there's about 50 people, including all the kids. And all. So we, we had to have, you know, you obviously see how that can get way out of control. We start inviting everybody. So what we wanted to do when we came back is have a reception for everybody. That'll be happening next week at 4 p.m. right here at the Bridge Goldsboro. Uh, we're handing out personal invitations, but we wanted to make sure that our Bridge Goldsboro family got a broad invite because we love you guys. And if you haven't had a chance to meet her, this would be a great time to be to do that. Are you guys ready to worship the Lord this morning? Come on, are you ready to worship God? Have, have we come into a room to watch something or have we have come into a room to bring something with us? Can you stand to your feet and let's worship God together? Thank 
Sing, you're a good father. You're a good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. A good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. the 
to me. 
Can we sing that one time? You've been just that good, so good to me. Oh, you've been just that good. If that's your story, sing. So good to me, Lord, without your love, where would I be? Lord, without your love, where would I be? Lord, without your love, where would I be? Oh, my God, you sure been good to me. Oh, my God, you sure been good to me. Can we worship this morning? Just give him a shout of praise. Come on, he's worthy. Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for your goodness, Lord, for your, for your goodness, Father. You're so good, Lord. You never fail, Lord. You never change, Lord. Lord, you've been faithful, Father. You've been kind. Lord, everything that you said you would do, Father, you do. And so this morning, Lord, we just recognize, Father, that you are good, that you are faithful, that you are amazing, Father, and we just love you, Lord. As a church, Lord, we recognize, Lord, that you are awesome, and we love you, Father. And we pray this all in your holy, precious name. Amen. You guys can be seated. over there and uh, during when we were singing and typically on Father's Day, that's one of the first things I do. I say good morning to him every day, but I typically I'll say happy Father's Day and it hit me over there. I ain't said happy, I've accepted several happy Father's Days, but I ain't said happy Father's Day to the Lord. And the thought occurred to me, you know, what, what things do we get from our dads that makes us want to say happy Father's Day to him? Well, we learn things from him. He shows us things about ourselves. Uh, he helps us be better people. He allows us to grow. So when we look back, you know, we're not the same people we were a year ago, 10 years ago, and we're actually moving forward in life. See, if you, that's what dads are supposed to do on this earth. And I thought, man, we don't have a better father than God our father who is perfect in all, that, all he does. The, the song said he's perfect in all of his ways. And I thought, happy Father's Day, God. Maybe you just want to say that if you haven't already with me on the count of three, one, two, three. Happy Father's Day, God. Happy Father's Day to everybody here who's a dad or watching online. If you're a dad, you could be a biological dad. I know we have stepdads in the house, adoptive dads, and uh, sometimes dads that, that get overlooked, but probably one of the most important, and that's spiritual fathers in the house. People, men that have looked and kind of spiritually adopted someone to help sort of mentor them. And maybe you have somebody in your life that you've looked at like that, and they've just been sort of a mentor to you. Uh, wish them a happy Father's Day today. Uh, I love the day and age we live in, the text message. Man, you can do a lot and speak to a lot of people with a text message. Did you know that? Uh, one of our values at the Bridge Goldsboro for leadership is communication. And uh, I always like to say, in the day and age we live in, there's no reason why you can't communicate the things you know to the people that need to know it. Uh, used to, you had to send a fax. And before that, a carrier pigeon. <laughs> Just be glad you don't have to do that anymore. So a quick text message, it makes a big difference. Uh, but we learn things from our dads. I, I saw a list recently of kids that were learning things from their fathers, and they were saying what the, the things that they learned. Uh, but here's a, a few things that kids are learning. Uh, one is how to relax. 
there was some kids in school and they were talking about what their dads did. And one kid said, my dad's a cop. The next kid said, my dad's a nurse. And the next kid said, my dad sits on his butt. Could be that he has an office job. We don't know. Dads teach us how to relax. Chance, who's a nine-year-old child, he's learning the importance of caffeine because he told his dad one morning, dad, no offense, but you're like the Hulk when you don't have your coffee. Aurora, who's seven years old, is learning honesty. She said, dad, let's play Spider-Man. He said, okay, which villain should I be? And she said, like he should already know, the fat one. Honesty. So we don't tell these kind of jokes on Mother's Day. We just has to be the dads. Aaliyah, who's four years old, she's learning how to pay attention to the details. After not being a very good girl, she was playing restaurant with her dad and she was taking his order and she said, Dad, what would you like? And he said, well, I want a daughter who listens and respects her parents. And she looked at him and said, I'm sorry, we don't have that. <laughs> we learn all kinds of things from dad. Some things, though, we don't learn from dad. Some things we actually have to learn on our own. Uh, reminds me of the adult child that went to his father on Father's Day and said, Dad, I learned everything from you except for one thing. And he said, what's that? He said, I learned that the family car really can do 110 miles an hour. And I didn't need your help at all. Dads, on top of teaching their children things, dads also tend to be what next kind of people. They don't spend too long on one thing. They, they want to get things done, fix the problems, offer solutions, and they want to move on to the next thing. Uh, that's typically why guys get in trouble with their wives when all the wives want to do is get them to listen. They don't want them to fix anything. Come on, women, say thank you, Jesus. They're nodding and, and groaning. And the guy's like, just wants to offer the solutions. And you're like, I don't want the solution. I just want to be heard and known. I want to be felt. Uh, but the guys are like, go get your girlfriend for that. Like, I really, like, bug their ear. Uh, we tend to be what, what's next kind of people. And that's kind of an appropriate segue to today's topic. We're in a series called I Am. We're talking about the statements that Jesus made to talk about exactly who he is. And the statement that we're looking at today is kind of a what's next kind of a statement. In actuality, it's an answer to a what's next kind of a question. And this is what John uh, chapter 11 records Jesus saying in verse 25. Jesus said this, I am, say I am, the resurrection and the life. Say it back. He says, I'm the one that is not only here to do certain things, but I'm here to resurrect things. Oftentimes we want Jesus to do one thing, but he's here to do something else. And often it's better than we thought. We just don't give him the time to actually do it. But he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. That's such a huge question that we have. What happens after death? What happens after I die? In fact, that's not just a question among Christians or religious people. That's actually a question among humanity. What happens next? Is there something? And some people say, hey, I don't believe that there's anything. But the fact that they had to answer that question for themselves says that it is an important question in their life. Even if they say, I don't believe that at all. I mean, you, they're still answering the question. The question still resides in every human. What happens after I die? What comes next? What can we expect? And honestly, I want to spend the majority of our time today not talking about after we leave here. I, I do want to address that for a second at the end, but I really kind of want to spend the majority of our time talking about things in this life that seem dead, and you wonder, could there ever be life in them again? Maybe today it's your passion for things that you used to have, but they seem all but dead now. It, could they ever be resuscitated? Maybe it's the situation in your life that you've just been working through for so long, you wonder if there could ever be life in it again. It just seems dead. Could it live again? And we're gonna, we're gonna look at a man named Lazarus in John chapter 11. And he's actually the brother of two sisters named Mary and Martha. And Jesus is close to this little family. Uh, in fact, the Bible says that they're friends. And Lazarus gets sick to the point that they're really worrying for his life. And the family sends word to Jesus because they knew what Jesus could do. They knew that Jesus could heal. By this time, Jesus has healings under his belt. And they asked Jesus to come to Bethany where they lived and to be with them. They wanted him to heal Lazarus. And there's a, some sort of a debate on how far away Jesus actually was, but he was within walking distance within a day. That's what, that's what we know. And 
In John chapter 11, verse 4, we read where Jesus hears this news. It says, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. Isn't that what you want to hear over your situation? This thing's not going to kill you. This thing that you think is dead, it's not going to end that way. No, he said, it's for God's glory so that the God's son may be glorified through it. And then it says, now Jesus loved Martha and he loved her sister, Mary. He loved Lazarus. So when he heard the news that Lazarus was sick, what does it say? He went right away. Did it say he went to Walgreens and picked up some medicine and got there as fast as he could? He stayed where he was two more days. That doesn't make sense, does it? Jesus he said he, he loved them, so, so he waits longer. He loves you, so he lets the thing linger a little bit, the thing that you think is going to kill you. It just doesn't make sense. If I got word that somebody was sick that I loved, I would be there in an instant as fast as I possibly could. But yet Jesus delays for two days. Have you ever been confused by God's timing? Have you ever been right in the thick of it and you're like, God, I'm ready for you to do this right now. Have you ever been to the place where you thought, I can't take another month of what I'm walking through right now. And, and when we start out, we're almost willing to give God some time because we know his time is not ours and, we, and, and we, we're going to give you some time. But have you ever been to the place where enough time goes by and you're like, God, where are you? If you don't show up, if you don't do something, I need you to make a move. I need you to bring clarity. But yet God waits. And he leaves you in what feels like a limbo. What feels like a vacuum where nothing is happening. And there's this important scripture that I, I think is so important for us to remind ourselves of. And the reason is because we already know the scripture, but yet sometimes we still get freaked out when God waits. And this is what it says in Isaiah 55, 8. It says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is God talking. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, we can't even calculate that. Our best telescopes can barely see 2% of the sky. It says, just like the heavens are higher than the earth, that's how high my ways are than yours how much higher they are in my thoughts, your thoughts. So I want us to understand a, a, a phrase, a concept, a principle this morning that they needed to understand and we need to understand today. And that's this, God's delay is not a contradiction of his love. God's delay is not a contradiction of his love. We tend to see love as being the result of God doing something in our lives that makes us more perfect that makes our situation a little better, that makes us a little more comfortable. And when God's love is really shown, the fact is, is that it's shown in a way that draws us closer to him, not necessarily makes us more comfortable. And often, hear me, God will delay so that the latter of that can happen, so that he can draw us in. Jesus wanted to do way more than make Lazarus healthy again. He wanted to do way more than heal him. And we're going to find out in a minute. But Jesus loved Lazarus. He, he loved him so much. He loved his sisters. And we see later that, that the shortest verse in the Bible is two words. Jesus wept. He, he was so moved by what was going on. He cared. But yet he doesn't go to them right away. He waits. He lingers. There's a bigger part of this story playing out. And God gets glory for it. Verse 17 says that on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been not just dead, but he had been in the tomb for four days. I want, you to, I want you to take note of that. Four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come from Jerusalem to Martha and Mary to comfort them in their loss. So Jerusalem's pretty close. All the, the Jews there, some people say that there was probably a prominent family for that many Jews to come from Jerusalem, but it was a close, so they came. But I want you to notice something here. Four days, it kind of seems to be a minor detail, but it's significant because for most ancient Jews, they would have believed, I'm not saying this is, this is right, but it's just like any culture, they believe different things. They believe that the, the spirit of a person would hang around and visit the body within those four days. And then by the time the, the fourth day got there, the body would begin to decompose and it would start to smell bad. And that's when the, the soul would completely abandon the body. Don't you think it's interesting that Jesus waited until every person there believed that there was no hope before he arrived? And some scholars will say that 
if it happened before that, within if Jesus had gotten there and done something within that four days, when they believed that the Spirit was kind of going back and forth, they, they could have believed that Jesus didn't do anything. It was just the Spirit sort of going back into the body and it being resuscitated. Isn't it amazing that, that God's timing often will be until there is, there is nothing else that can get the glory from your situation but him? They got to the point four days after he died that there was no hope, that nobody there believed that it, it, was, it could happen. It was too late. The funeral had already taken place. That's why everybody's there. And both of his sisters are a little frustrated and they're confused. They love Jesus. One of them even believes that Jesus, you, you can still do anything if, if you ask God. I know he listens to you. But they're confused as to why he waited. In fact, both of them look at Jesus at different times. Verse 21, Martha looked at Jesus and said, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Can you imagine that? Mary looked at him in verse 32 said, said uh, she fell at his feet. Lord, if you had just been here, my brother would not have died. What were they saying? They were saying what we often say. Jesus, you could have helped. Jesus, you could have done something. Jesus, you could have inter intervened. Have you ever felt that way? Jesus, if you had of just, and you fill in the blank, if you had of just healed my, my dad, if you had of just healed my wife, then I wouldn't be sitting here today like, like I am. Lord, if you had done something in my marriage, then it would have been saved. If you, if, you had, if you had been in that situation, then I wouldn't be in this mess. And this is kind of what they're, what they're asking uh, and, and telling Jesus. If you had just been here, Jesus... People don't understand what's going on. They're, they're emotional. They've experienced this loss of Lazarus. They're frustrated. But Jesus is up to something. Look at verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, he came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. And he said, take away the stone. And then Martha speaks up. Lord, she must be the responsible one of the bunch. By this time, there's a bad odor. <laughs> he's decomposing. For he's been there four days. If you read the King James Version, it says, by this time he stinketh. You ever told your kids that when they come home from school? You stinketh. Go take a shower. You have school on you. Anybody have like nine or ten year old boys? If you don't, just wait. They stinketh like another kind of stinketh. not in the story. That's just my own personal testimony. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that was going to go over so well. Let me draw you back. <laughs> what was Martha saying? She was looking at Jesus and she was saying it's too late. By this time, not only is he dead, by this time it's decomposing. Lord, some of us are in here today and, and, and we're going, not only is my situation a, a goner, but it's so far gone, I don't even think Jesus can bring it back. We, we, we often think like that. But I just want you to know that when Jesus enters your situation, there's hope. That when Jesus shows up on the scene, there's something that he's doing that nothing else can do, nothing else can accomplish. I look at other situations in the scriptures where there just seemed to be no hope, where, where it just got to the, the very end of what they thought was possible, way past asking Jesus. I, the, the woman with the issue of blood, I don't know why she had to wait 12 years. 12 years. She had this issue. She spent every last penny she had on doctors, but by the time Jesus showed up, what had happened? It took one touch and she was healed. I think about the man at the tombs that was demon-possessed and had a legion of demons on the inside of him. I don't know why he ever even got to that point. A long time of suffering. This man is, is now not just walking among everybody. He's living in the tombs because he's, he's not even sociable anymore, going all but insane, abandoning his family. But by the time Jesus showed up, all it took was a word, and he was healed. I don't know what you've been walking through. I don't know how long you've been on the journey, but I just want to encourage you today to say this. When Jesus is on the scene, there is hope. Don't give up. Did you know that the victory that you've already imagined in your mind, that Jesus is able to accomplish it? And, and that's true. The victory that you've already imagined and for some of you, that's all it is. It's just something that you thought in your head. God is capable to bring it about. You, you yourself are a creation. 
and you are so limited. But if you have the ability as a creation to imagine it, then the creator, God, has the ability to accomplish it. Now, that is not a statement that is a name it and claim it. You can just say, hey, I want a million dollars. I can imagine that. And, and God has the ability to accomplish that. God does things according to his will. And the Bible says when we ask God according to his will, it will be done for us. How do we know what God's will is? Romans 12 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind and don't follow after the pattern of this world. He said, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's perfect will is. Some people are asking God some crazy things that ain't got nothing to do with his will. And it ain't because you, you know, you're trying to be a bad person, but it's because you don't know his word. Because we haven't transformed our thinking to, to understand who God really is. But when we get with the Lord, when we put our trust and our faith and our hope in him, the Bible says he begins to transform our thought life. And we begin to think different thoughts. And it begins to be different than what this world does. Different from what our friends may do. And they can't understand why we're sowing seed into the church. Or they can't understand why we're taking this money and we're, we're giving it to this homeless person. They can't understand why we're taking our time and our talent to go serve somewhere. It just doesn't compute. But God says, when I get a hold of you and you draw near to me, I will change the way you think. And you, your priorities will begin to shift. And that's when we begin to understand what God's good and perfect will is. And that's the, the, the context by which I say, if you can imagine it as a creation, then God as the creator can accomplish it. That's why Ephesians 3.20 says, with God's power working in us, God can do much, much more than anything we could ever imagine. What am I telling you? I'm telling you it's going to be better than you thought by the time Jesus gets a hold of it. So Martha says, he stinks. Don't do it. <laughs> we, we don't take the stone away. In verse 40, Jesus said, didn't I tell you if you believe you'll see the glory of God? So they took the stone away and Jesus looked up. And this is interesting. He begins to pray. Father, he out loud, I thank you that you've heard me and I knew that you always hear me, but I'm saying this for the benefit of everyone standing here that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said this, Jesus calls out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. How many of you are waiting for God to say that in your situation? Just speak the word. Do you know that he can? He said, Lazarus, come out. The Bible says the dead man came out. Even dead things are, are possible to come back to life when Jesus gets a hold of it. He called Lazarus' name. Lazarus, come out. I love what Charles Spurgeon said when he said, it's a good thing he called out Lazarus specifically because with the power that's in Jesus Christ, if he had just said come out, he'd have emptied the whole graveyard. Everybody would have come out. So Lazarus comes out, his hands and feet still wrapped with strips of linen, a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to everybody, oh, to get, take that man's grave clothes off of him. Let him go. When Jesus enters your situation, there's hope. Even when it looks hopeless. Even when the dream is dead. Even when the relationship seems doomed. Even when the situation couldn't stinketh any more than it already does. When you have Jesus in your life, there is, there's hope when he's in it. Can I tell you that sometimes when you're praying for something to happen, sometimes we get a little jaded when he doesn't do it in the timing or exactly the way that he thought he would. And I just want to encourage you. Sometimes you may be praying for God to do one thing in your life, but Jesus is wanting to do it a different kind of a way. And in fact, the way he's going to do it is even better than what you were praying. Remember Isaiah, when he's, God says, my ways aren't your ways. My thoughts aren't your thoughts. Can I just give you a Pastor Ryan translation right there? What you think you want, I really know what you want. You, you, you don't even know yourself better than I know you. And I love the fact that when we pray, God is working all things together for our good, not necessarily according to what we think, but according to what he knows. And I think we should end every prayer when we're asking God to do something the same way Jesus ended it in the Garden of Gethsemane. God, this is how I think I should do it. But nevertheless, your will be done. And I think if we leave that place in our hearts for God to have his way, for him to do it another way, then I think that's when we end up getting the result that was better than what we imagined. It, it becomes better than new. See, they wanted Jesus to come and heal Lazarus. But in fact... In verse 37, it said, Jesus opened the eyes of the blind man. Why couldn't he keep Lazarus from dying? Why, why couldn't he heal him? But Jesus delayed two whole days. Why did he do that? Because Jesus didn't want to heal him. Jesus wanted to resurrect him. 
Jesus didn't want to take what was new and, or old and fix it. Jesus wanted to take something that was dead and make it come alive better than new. See, they knew Jesus as a healer, but he was revealing himself now as the resurrection and the life. And God not only heals things, he resurrects dead things. And I want to ask you, what things are dead in your life that you're wanting God to bring back? What would it take to bring them back to life? And as we come close to the end of this, I, I, I want to bring your attention back to something that Jesus said over and over again in these verses. We're going to reread them. And it's the word believe. Say believe. What, what would it take to raise dead things to life? Well, Jesus told us over and over and over again. I don't know if you caught it. In verse 14, when Jesus is talking to his disciples, he said, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may Say it with me. Believe. But let us go to him. In verse 25, when Jesus is responding to Martha, he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who, you're catching on. Come on, everybody else. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by in me will never die. Do you? <laughs> is that the next one? Oh, it's not up there. I'm sorry. Do you believe this, he said? I was getting ready to get on you for not knowing how to read, but, you know. He said, do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I, I believe that you're the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And when Jesus said, take the stone away, and Martha was still a little bit concerned because he, <laughs> y'all remember that one, because he stinketh. Jesus said, did I, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. When Jesus prayed right before calling Lazarus out, he said, so they took the stone away. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may, that they may believe that you sent me. Over and over again, believe, believe, believe. Jesus works in our faith. Did you know that what you believe about Jesus determines your perspective and your situation? It's what you believe about him. It's what you've put your faith in. Jesus could show you miracle after miracle, but it's your belief in him that moves him to make the difference. In fact, when he went back to his own hometown, people were looking at him as a man and they were like, hey, aren't you Joseph's son? You're not God in the flat. You're Joseph's kid. We know you. And they just couldn't put their faith in the fact that this could be God's son. And he walked away and the Bible says that he could do little miracles in that town. It wasn't because he wasn't able to. It was because of their belief in him. You have a God that specializes in resurrections. You have a, a Jesus Christ that died for you. And that not only did he raise from the dead, but he turns around and says, I can bring dead things back to life in your life. There is nothing too hard for him. Do you believe that? And so he, he comes to the Bethany. He says, believe, believe over and over again. He's trying to get them to see, hey, I, I didn't come right away because I want to do something better than what you thought. I, I want to put a faith in you that, was, that you couldn't get if I just healed him. I want to do something in your life that's better than what you're even praying for. Do you believe that I'm going to do that in you? Do, do you believe that I'm for you? He's saying, do you believe that even though it might seem dead to you, it's still possible for me because all things are possible with God. Do you believe? Look at the result in verse 45. When it was all said and done, it says, therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed. They believed in him. And the question today, as I land this plane on Father's Day, is do you believe in him? Have you put your faith in Jesus. At the beginning of this message, I talked about the fact that we were, gonna, we were gonna talk through things in this life that are dead, that Jesus can resurrect, that Jesus can pour life into. In the second part of that, I, I said I would mention towards the end, what you believe about Jesus also determines where you spend eternity. That every single person on this planet, every person in this room, every person under the sound of my voice is going to spend somewhere after this life is over. And according to the Bible that we hold high and believe in, it's either going to be heaven or it's going to be a place that wasn't made for you called hell. And Jesus is the only way. It, what you believe about him determines where you spend it. In fact, in Acts chapter 4 verse 12 Peter is standing before the Pharisees and he says, there is salvation in no one else. 
No one else but Jesus. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And that belief in Jesus and that belief that, that comes with salvation means there's coming a day when this life on earth is going to end, but you'll be able to experience an eternity in heaven with him. Talk about life. We, we, want, we think things are cool when Jesus brings things back to life on earth. Can you imagine? And I'm going to go ahead and say you can't because the Bible says we can't even begin to fathom the depths of God's wisdom and knowledge by which not only did he make this earth, but he's creating a heaven, a new heaven and a new earth for you and for me. And my prayer today is that, that we would believe that, that we would believe in Jesus. Not only that, not just believe he exists because Satan believes he exists. He knows he does but to put our trust in him, to put our faith in him, to walk through life and say, hey, I'm, I'm not gonna trust myself, but I'm gonna trust Jesus because he is who he said he was, the resurrection and the life, and I'm gonna follow him. And that belief in him will begin to shape our perspective by not only which we see our circumstances, but by which we see our eternity. And today, as we end, I, I wanted to end today by taking communion together by celebrating the fact that Jesus died on the cross to make that possible. The fact that he died means that we don't have to. That when we leave this earth, that's, that's the easy part. <laughs> the fact that we have a life fully in heaven forever, that's the part that, that Jesus confirms in us because his blood was shed in our place. If you're watching online, go grab uh, something from the cabinet, a cracker or some juice or something like that. You take communion with us. And if you put your heart and your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, I want you to take this with me. Uh, I want you to stand to your feet. And I just want you to take this, this cracker if you're here on site, if you're watching online, whatever you've got, a piece of bread. And I just want you to hold it up. The Bible says where there is no shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And we could never shed our own blood because we're not perfect. Jesus was a perfect sacrifice, meaning that he never sinned. Every single one of us, the Bible says, has fallen short of God's glorious standard. And what that means in layman's terms is that God's standard is perfection. I like to say it like this. If it wasn't perfect, if he wasn't perfect, if he didn't demand perfection, he wouldn't be a God worth worshiping. He'd be a God that accepts imperfection. That's not perfect. The, the fact that he never lowered a standard one time makes him still God and holy and righteous and perfect. And he didn't expect us to, to rise up with works and somehow earn it because we can't be perfect. Every other religion on the planet has some system where you have to do works in order to, to meet a certain thing in order to be worthy of whatever the prize is in that particular religion. Christianity is the only one where God never called us up like that. He sent Jesus down. And he sent his own son as, as, as a human being in the flesh, 100% human and 100% God at the same time, being tempted in every single way, just like we were, the Bible says, except he sinned not. Can you imagine what he went through? Some of us today failed on the way to church. I mean, and, and thank God for his grace and his mercy that when we call out to him in the name of Jesus Christ, who is perfect in our stead, the Bible says he is righteous and just and he will forgive us. Thank you, Lord, for that. And this cracker right here and the bread you've got at home, it represents the body of Christ. There's nothing magical about it other than the fact that our hearts are saying, we're remembering what you did for us on the cross. And when Jesus did this with his disciples, he said, this, is, this represents my body that's getting ready to be broken for you. Every sin you've ever committed, church, every sin you ever will commit, if you come in in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who is perfect in our stead, God is faithful and just to forgive. And we remember it by holding this bread and saying, this is your body that was broken. We're so grateful for you. And we take it together, remembering Jesus, what you did for us. Let's take it together. And he was with his disciples before he went to the cross and he held up the cup and he held it up and said, this is the blood of a new covenant. The old covenant, if you read through the Old Testament, demanded that they sacrifice perfect animals, as perfect as they could be. And God accepted that as a substitute. 
But in time, Jesus sent the Lamb of God, sent the Lamb of God, which was Jesus Christ. It was the perfect substitute that none ever needed to be slain again. And this represents his blood, the perfect blood that was shed on the cross for you and for me. And when God saw it, it was enough. It was perfect. It was in your place. And because the blood of Jesus was shed, you don't have to spend an eternity in hell. You don't have to experience that death. And Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and the life, and nobody comes through the Father except through me. And so we just thank Jesus for his blood that was shed. And I just feel a need to pray right now. Thank you, Father, for giving Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for lovingly doing it. Lord, we, we couldn't shed our own blood because it was not worthy enough. But you came not only to, to be here, God, but you came to serve others. The Bible says you didn't come to be served. You came to serve even to the point of death on a cross, giving your life up for a ransom for many. And Lord, we know we fall on that number, believing in you and putting our trust in what you did for us on the cross. So we take this in remembrance of you and focus on you today. In Jesus' name, let's take it together. You guys remember the words to Amazing Grace? I wonder if we could just sing that together before we end. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Sing it. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now I see. Thank you for the restoring power, God, that you have. That when we come to you as sinful as we are, Lord, that you are faithful and just to forgive. And we're grateful for that. Lord, on this day, on this Father's Day, we just, we just celebrate you as our Father. And we also celebrate your Son and what you did for us. If there's anybody here today that would say, I, I have put my faith in Jesus Christ today. Maybe you just want to confirm that with this. Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe that you, you really did die on the cross for me. I believe that you rose from the grave. And I know there is no other way to heaven besides you. I accept you today. I put my faith in you today, of my belief in you today. In the mighty, powerful name of Jesus. Lord, and I just say a prayer over all the fathers in this room and those watching online. Lord, that you would empower them to be the men they need to be. Lord, that you would anoint them to be the, the, the leaders of their home. And I pray that as you go about doing that, that they would feel your presence with them to be empowered, to be successful in their jobs, to be successful in their marriages, to be successful as a parent. Lord, and that when, a, when the day is said and done, God, they give you the glory and honor for it. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Can we get a big amen? amen? Thank you so much for worshiping with the Bridge Goldsboro. We pray that the sermon was a blessing to you. And listen, if you made that choice to accept Jesus today, we want to know about that. Do us a favor and take a moment to fill out the Connect card. We want to know how we can come alongside you and help you with your walk. We look forward to worshiping with you next week. Have a great week.